Try that now. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, there we go. So, crowdfunding. Um, so, as Henry said, I'm working on the wind, tide, and oil project. Um, I'm working alongside my brother, Hugh Wall, who's an artist filmmaker. Um, and we received an Arts Council, um, Arts Council funding in January last year. Um, and our bid for the funding included match funding that was to come from Crowdfunder to make up the full amount needed to make the film. Um, so in May 2022, last year, um, we launched a Crowdfunder campaign. We had a target of £10,000, which was all to be used to purchase the 16mm analogue film that Hugh uses to make the final film. Um, the campaign ran for four weeks and we received just under 11,000 in total from the public, from 91 supporters overall. Um, so I'm no crowdfunder expert, but I did learn a lot from the experience. And um, so I'll share with you what I learned and hopefully you'll get a sense of what is involved in crowdfunding and what you need in order to do it. So in very simple terms, crowdfunding is about raising money from individuals who each donate the relatively small amount that adds up to the whole amount of the money that you need. Um, it's usually done on the internet using various platforms, which I'll talk about later. And why do it? So there are numerous reasons to opt to raise money through crowdfunding instead of or alongside other funding options. Um, when you put your idea or project out there, you're essentially opening yourself up to feedback from the public. Um, so a successful project proves that people are interested um, and that there's an audience who cares and that your project is worthwhile, um, which is very uplifting to be the recipient of such interest and support. Um, and the campaign, if done well, will also audi um, widen your audience and increase your reach spreading awareness of what you're doing. Um, it's possible to attract people who've never heard of your project before, and it kind of actively involves the audience with the project so that they become participants. And um, so we really felt this to be true for Wind, Tide and All. Um, our following massively increased during our campaign. Um, people started getting in touch, telling us how interesting they thought the project was. Um, and of course, the, the campaign will raise money. Um, so crowdfunding can avoid the long and arduous funding applications um, and it's a very effective and positive way to bring in the funds needed. Um, so I believe there are three things that are essential to have before you embark on a crowdfunding campaign. Um, so these three, three things would be originality, time and skills. So it's important to have a hook that will grab the audience's attention. So for our project, um, it was the uniqueness of the project that sparked people's interest. So no one's that I know of made a film about engineless sailing and then toured it on an engineless barge while sail, sail training before. So it's quite a unique project, which I think really helped get people inspired. Um, so it's worth thinking creatively and exploring how you can make your project stand out. Um, time, it quickly became clear to us that um, there's a huge amount of work involved with doing a crowdfunder campaign. Um, it took a lot longer than we thought. Um, and this will vary from project to project, depending on the specifics. Um, but I'd recommend overestimating how much time you would need to prepare the, the campaign. Um, and yeah, the planning stages uh, really does take um, a lot of most of the, the time uh, and it's the most important stage. Um, and skills, there are various skills which you need at least the basics of to run a good campaign. Um, so they include project managing, networking, social media, design and others. Um, you don't want to be learning new skills whilst you're trying to run the campaign. And it's a good idea to have a team of people who together would make up a wide skill set. 
So for our campaign, it was Hugh and I, and then we had the help of a designer who's Gina Nadal, who really helped us both with design and social media. Um, so that's the three essential things I think you need to have uh, for a crowdfunding campaign before you begin. <clears throat> um, so I'll now take you through what our campaign looks like and what was involved with running the campaign. Um, I've broken it down into four stages, which are the planning stage, the launch, the campaign itself, and the delivery. So stage one is the planning stage. Um, I would say, as I kind of touched on before, um, the planning stage is the most important stage of the process. Um, it will make the other stages much easier and will improve the likelihood, likelihood of success. Um, so in hindsight, we actually could have planned more than we did for Wintide and All. Uh, we didn't have an overall project plan, but I think looking back now, it would have been really useful to have an overview of what needed to be done with a clear path through. Um, we did make a social media plan, which was just a spreadsheet that planned out exactly what we would post on social media each day. Um, and that plan gave us a clear tra trajectory um, and enabled us to think up interesting ideas for different posts. And um, it wasn't meticulous, but it was enough. Uh, and you could do the same for an email campaign. Um, so another part of the planning stage is a network and um, creating a network. Um, so networking for us was a huge part of the campaign. And that doesn't just include the audience, but also the network behind the scenes who supported the project and helped it reach people. So we partnered with National Historic Ships and Maritime Heritage, for example, who gave us a lot of support throughout the campaign. Um, they promoted us on social media. They shared all our posts. We featured in their newsletter, um, which really helped for us. Um, we also reached out to various other organizations and businesses. For example, we spoke to Yarmouth Orskins, the clothing company, who really appreciated, appreciated our project and wanted their brand to be involved. So they gave us some gift vouchers to offer as rewards, and they connected us to other companies that also helped. Um, some of the businesses that we reached out to were not as receptive. So there was a much larger clothing brand that we spoke to who felt quite cold. Uh, they wanted us to wear their clothes in the film. And um, so they were suggesting things that wouldn't have worked for us. Um, and it felt to us it was best to work with people that were genuinely inspired by the project. Um, we also tried to, or we made sure that we offered to give something back and it was a reciprocal relationship. So we, we uh, promoted the, the brands um, and the organizations as much as possible. Um, I helped with a photo shoot on one occasion. So we didn't have much to offer back, but we what we could, we we did offer. Um, so as well as uh, partners, media is also really important. Um, so in our planning stage, we contacted all the relevant magazines and local papers and the radio. Um, we were featured in Yachting Monthly, Classic Boat and the local newspaper. Um, we sent out a press release to all the media contacts when the crowdfunder was just about to go live. Um, and we know that some big donations came from the readership of these magazines. So it was a really important step. Um, so I think it's really important to map out your network and then nurture it during the planning stage so that it then supports you during the campaign. Um, and another part of the planning stage, um, is creating a project page on uh, a crowdfunding platform. So you have to choose from these various platforms or do crowdfunding or a form of crowdfunding. And they're all slightly different. Um, and yeah, these are some of the, just some of them. Um, so Hugh and I use Crowdfunder. Um, it's very well known. And there were several other maritime related projects that had been successful on Crowdfunder. Um, it was very easy to use and um, had some pretty cool features and so I would recommend it um, but they all offer different things so I'd, yeah it's good to like do some research and see what would work for you. 
Um, and then on the crowdfunder page, there are various things you'll need to create and decisions that you'll need to make about the project. And this is kind of the landing page for your audience who come to this page and they see what the project is about and this is where they donate. Um, so you need a video um, that's about two to three minutes long that explains the project and is kind of quite engaging, quite personal and direct. Um, a, you need to choose your target, which is how much you're actually asking for. So we're, we asked for £10,000. Um, the recommendation is to choose like a really realistic number and not be kind of going to like what's the minimum that you can um, ask for or what's the minimum you can do the project with. Um, and a budget, so you need to explain what you're spending the money on. Uh, that's really important, I think, so people know where the money's going. Um, rewards. So you can, with most of these sites, I think you can offer rewards in exchange for donations. Um, and you can kind of put them in different price ranges. And um, so we had a huge price range from £10 to £5,000 of different rewards. Um, it's really worth doing that amount of price range, even going up to really kind of expensive. So someone did actually um, choose our £5,000 reward, um, which was obviously a massive contribution to the project. And we never expected someone would, but they did. So it was really helpful. Um, with rewards, it's really good to have quite a lot of variety. Um, so we had lots of like, we had some handmade things on offer, handmade key ring. Um, we had experiences like an online screening preview or VIP tickets to a music event. Uh, so variety is really good and a variety of price range too. Um, so you also need to choose the funding method for your campaign, which is between keep what you raise and all or nothing. So keep what you raise is where whatever money you raise from your donations, you get to keep even if you don't meet your target and the all or nothing is where you only get to keep um, the money if you've reached your target so choosing between the two it's quite a big decision and it really depends on what your project is um, and how confident you are of meeting the target for us we had quite a small audience to begin with a uh, very small following because we were right at the beginning of the project um, and so we weren't that confident and also we knew that we could, um, any money would help us. So it wasn't as if, because we had the Arts Council funding, it wasn't as if we needed a certain amount of money in order to do the project. It was just any money that went towards it would be helpful. Whereas with some projects, you might need the, the whole amount or you may as well have nothing if it, if it needs that whole amount to do anything. Um, so stage two of the campaign is the launch. Um, so this is where uh, your crowdfunding campaign goes live to the public. Um, it's recommended that you secure 10% of, of your target in the first 72 hours of the campaign being live. So you want to get all of your friends and family and closest supporters to donate as soon as you go live. Um, so this really helps the project look viable and interesting to others um, if it's kind of got that immediate support to, from the beginning. Um, we started warming up the crowd a little on social media before we went live. Um, if I was to do it again, I'd probably do much more of a warm up, perhaps some events or webinars maybe. Um, so yeah, I think it's good to get people interested before it goes live. So stage three is uh, the campaign. So the campaign was quite intense. Uh, it's four weeks long, or ours, our duration was four weeks long. You can kind of choose how long you do it for. Um, and so I worked on it full time during that time. Um, and it's necessary to post on social media once a day, I think. Uh, we actually timed each post, so it would go out at 5pm when people were leaving work. Um, 
we posted everything to lots of different Facebook groups to try and widen the reach. Um, we wrote updates through the crowdfunding website, keeping people informed and motivated to share the project. We contacted the press as much as possible during this time and um, secured a few articles and mentions on the radio. Um, it can be quite a roller coaster. Um, the donations tend to drop in the middle of the, of the campaign. Uh, and for us, there were a few kind of, or maybe a whole week of like a bit of worry, not thinking that we weren't going to quite make it. Um, but then it picked up momentum. So it's, it's important to keep going and keep that momentum going. Um, so these are just two pictures of our two most popular posts on social media. Um, so I just wanted to give you an example of kind of what we were posting. Um, so the one on the left was a post about my story and how I got into sailing. And the one on the right was a post about the history of the Earth and how recent the advent of the engine was. So we saw huge spikes in our reach um, on our social media following both of these posts. Um, we hardly did any posts that asked directly for donations. So we focused on engaging the crowd and getting them interested. Um, and I think these posts in particular, the fact that they were quite personal and direct really helped. So yeah, I'd recommend making posts that are interesting and personal. Um, so stage four is the delivery. Um, so the delivery stage happens once the crowdfunder is over. The first step we took was to offer a big thank you to everyone involved. And then we began to gather our awards. We sent out the handmade key rings and the gift vouchers and day sales and all the things like that. And many of our awards are not being released until the film premieres in 24. So uh, it's kind of a, a slow burn. Um, and we're also keeping our supporters updated, sending updates through crowdfunder website and social media and newsletters every few months, um, if not more. Um, and we'll be inviting all of our supporters to celebrate with us when the film is finally premiered. So they'll be part of the, of the final event and therefore part of the whole journey, really. So you might be thinking now, how do I guarantee success? <laughs> um, so I think being successful relies on you doing your research, putting the time into planning and building a supportive network, um, giving your time and dedication, um, and this will really show up in how your crowdfunder appears to others. So if you believe in your project, that's kind of the first step to other people believing in it too. Um, being able to sell it is quite important um, and don't give up. As I said, it can be a roller coaster, so keep going to the end. Um, and being unsuccessful, <laughs> so nothing is guaranteed um, and it's really difficult to predict exactly what response people have to the project. Um, but any money raised is a success uh, and even just gaining interest from, from more people is a success as well. And you can always try again. Perhaps after a break, you can launch another campaign approaching things slightly differently. Um, and there's no rules for how many times you can run a crowdfunding campaign, which is part of the beauty of it, really. So, yeah, that was my take on, on crowdfunding. Um, there are lots of resources online that give guidance on how to run a project or a campaign. Um, and so there's some manuals written by the crowdfunder platform, which I'm, I'll share a link of in the chat in a moment. Um, and please feel free to visit our website and sign up to our newsletter if you want to receive updates about the project or get in touch. Um, and thank you to anyone listening who did support our crowdfunder. We're extremely grateful. Um, and we're going to be holding various events in the future. So do follow us on social media or via the website to find out more. Um, and I'll hand back to, to Henry. Rose, thank you very much indeed. That was uh, that was really most interesting, and uh, I'm sure there'll be quite a few questions on that. Um, apologies to everybody who may have uh, had a bit of delay getting onto the um, chat, but it is functioning now. So please do put in your questions or comments on that uh, and the Q and A as well. Unfortunately, the webinar format means that not everybody can see everything, but uh, you should be able to put in things on either of those. 
and uh, we'd be very happy to follow up. Thank you again, Rose. That was terrific. And I'm sure we will want to come back on that. So now I'd like to go on to our next speaker, who is Felicity Lees, who is operations manager at the Pioneer Sailing Trust. Uh, and that is a very well-known uh, sail training uh, organization on the East Coast um, <clears throat> and uh, well-known to many. Uh, what makes them really special at the moment is that they're one of very few people who've actually got su successful with the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Uh, and they just achieved a, a ground one pass for really what is a very big project. Uh, and that is to, to reach and attain maximum benefit, to restore two historic vessels and to reach and attain maximum benefit uh, for community audiences and deliver a sustainable business model for their long-term operation. So there's a lot in there about vessels, there's a lot in there about community and about other social benefits. And that's what I think many of us looking at what is required for the National Lottery Heritage Fund would like to know more of. So thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Felicity. Hopefully you can share screen. It'll tell me if I need to do anything. Hello, <laughs> I'm just trying to get to my share screen. So just, just while you're doing that, just to remind everybody else that uh, if you've got any links or information, uh, Rose has just very kindly put in key links on Crowdfunder into the uh, uh, chat box. So those are there to be followed up. Uh, and then uh, after Felicity, we will hear from Delphine Jasmine Belil for uh, Maritime Heritage Trust and Heritage Alliance, and then we will open up for our discussion uh, and welcome uh, Hannah, uh, Hannah Cunliffe and John McGorrick. So uh, over to you, Felicity. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, we can see that now, Felicity. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, that bit took a little bit of time. And um, yeah, so um, I was just going to talk a little bit about the trust and um, sort of the background and then um, about our latest project. So just to give you a, a, a bit of background about Pioneer Sailing Trust and what we've done in the past and what we're planning. So, um, so Pioneer started, uh, actually I'll start, I'll start here actually, um, started with the idea to uh, to restore Pioneer, which is uh, a Skillinger smack, and this is the wreck of Pioneer, um, when they first looked at it, and believe it or not, that was the best example of, of a Skillinger smack that they found, so they set about um, restoring it. <laughs> That's when they dug it, dug, dug around it to see a bit more of it. And um, that's when they floated it and um, started the rebuild. And that's what it looked like when it was finished. Um, so at that point, when it was um, when it was finished, they they hadn't got anything inside Pioneer. So they knew that they wanted to use the boat to for sail training, and they knew they wanted to use it for a platform to teach young people. Um, but they 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 needed to actually fit out the inside of Pioneer. So up to this point, Pioneer was um, funded through lots of different sort of private sources, and it wasn't until this point that they actually went for lottery funding. So the they got lottery funding for all the fit out of Pioneer, which meant it could be used to to go on further. Um, so trips abroad and uh, local trips, as well as um, up and down the East Coast, because people could actually sleep on board. So it was pretty essential in uh, Pioneer being able to do the work that she does now. 
So this is just a bit of an idea of what we do. So we are a charity and we focus mainly on taking groups from around Essex um, and they're groups of up to 12 people that we take out. Um, and we, we work with a lot of um, other charities. That's our main sort of target in youth groups. Um, and the whole idea is that by coming out on Pioneer, they're really going to get something from that. And what we wanted to do is offer next step after that. So it's not just about coming out sailing, it's how can we engage them a bit further? So after that, so Pioneer's, Pioneer at this point had been operating for several years and um, had got other funding um, from different sources. And in 2014, went for another um, lottery bid which uh, was the Land and Sea Project. Um, this, this, this bid was written by David Tornay. And the Land and Sea Project was a three-year project and it was about um, 800,000. And through this project, we had several boat building projects. So um, one of the projects was, um, it was called Trinity. So the idea was um, to restore Trinity and use her as the tent of a pioneer. So to take the, um, people from the base at Harker's Yard out to Pioneer. So that's what it looked like before. Again, it was sort of saved and it was sunk. <laughs> and um, this is what it looked like with the apprentices that built it um, in there. <laughs> uh, and then we also had the Priscilla project. So. Uh, this is a much smaller version of um, Pioneer, so it would, uh, would have been a local smack. And this is what it looked like before we started work and before we moved her. Um, and you can see there's a tree growing out of it. <laughs> we, uh, we took, so what we needed to do actually before, before anything was to build the, the frame around it. So to stabilise before we could actually move her because once we start, once we started work, this is what happened. Um, so this was encased in, in concrete to preserve her. And once we started sort of taking off the concrete, it collapsed. But the point is that it's still a restoration project um, because it, it was the physical boat that we had. Um, and it was the space that was, uh, the boat was, um, built in the same space so we could have left it where it was and built another boat in the shed but it was the actual boat that we took in there so this is what it looked like after a bit more cleaning out um and there's a lot of work to do and the the one of the things that um we wanted to do was engage um uh, the apprentices so was, there was a training project around uh, Priscilla and Trinity um, there was also a touring play, so um, some of you might have even remembered it. It was called Oysters and Oil Skins. We had a book made from that as well, um, and the local four, um, sorry, three youth, um, they, uh, they, they produced the book. Um, and we had um, a play as well, which did, um, it did, I think, 52 different locations. Um, so it, it was all about how... Um, you engage the you know the wider audience and those are some of the things that we thought about doing so that's Priscilla after well nearly finished <laughs> uh, and that's it on its launch day uh, and again all these opportunities and sort of launch events and things like that are all opportunities to to talk about the heritage lottery and the way it was funded and that's what they're looking for. They really want you to sort of shout about um, what you've done and how you did it and, and, and also use their name as much as you can. So we, this, is, this is one of the events that we use to do that. Um, alongside our, and the apprenticeship scheme was also a way for us to engage a, a wider audience. Um, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So, yeah, what are, what are our plans now? So um, that project, so our land and sea project that finished in 2017. And um, so it's been a few years uh, developing new ideas. 
And what we really wanted to do was create a more sustainable model. So we didn't rely on funding year on year. And uh, this, this project is hopefully going to do that. So I'll just talk you through um, the stages of applying for a lottery grant. Um, the stage one is um, your expression of interest. And it's only a thousand words. It's very short, but it, it, it's, it's basically giving the, the lottery an idea of what you want to do and how you're going to do it and the outcomes that you want to achieve. So it's really important at this stage that you start thinking about um, your outcomes and the outcomes for you aligning with the outcomes of the lottery. So uh, the, the main outcome um, is that your project has got to involve a wider range of people. Um, so even at this stage, you've got to think about that. What and how are you going to do that? And then what are you going to do afterwards? So even at the very early stage, you need to be thinking about that. Um, and the, the, the question and the answers, they're sort of 200 words, 100 words, so that they don't give you a, a, they don't give you a lot of space to write your answers. Um, but that first um, expression of interest, um, when you've submitted it, you get an answer back within 12, uh, 20 working days. So it's quite a quick turnaround um, to, to, to know if you're successful or not. So that's that's what we did. We we were then um, allowed to submit our um, application. Um, so that's it's stage one application, which is a lot lot harder, <laughs> a lot more work. So you you're given twelve months from the from your expression of interest and um, being successful um, to your next um, part of the application. So. Um, you've got to write it within that time, otherwise um, it becomes invalid. We actually wrote ours in three months, which um, <laughs> was quite stressful. I wouldn't recommend that, actually. Um, if I was to do it again, I would probably take at least six months. Um, and the reason for that is some of the um, supporting documents that you need. So the supporting documents are almost as... as as much work to get them as the application itself. That's what I found anyway. Um, so the supporting documents, you need accounts, you need your business plan. And um, if you have, if you are doing a boat restoration, you need your proof of ownership. If you are going, going to um, do building work, you need to show your planning permission. Um, thinking about the local area and support from local uh, local people and businesses and um, all sorts of groups you need at least six letters of support um, which can take a little bit of time you need to think about your costs and your breakdown and your timetable you need to think about um, the phases and, and how long it's all going to take you so um, there's also risk assessments so the risk assessments are are not just um just your normal sort of risk assessment it's all sort of financial risk assessment um you've also got to look at condition reports because we are a, a boat builders anyway we could do the condition reports but you might need to um to get somebody to do that for you um and you also need to write job descriptions for any new person that you think you will need in the project. So any any job that's going to come up in the project, you need to write the job descriptions. Um, if you are working with a partner organisation, you've also got to think about how that relationship is going to work. So um, we had a, a memorandum of understanding right from the very start. Um, if we wanted to work with a partner organisation, that's that's quite important that you're clear with that. You need a financial controls policy. Um, you need a project management structure. You need estimated running costs. Um, and if possible, statements of significance. And statements of significance um, is something that can, can come in a later stage, but I think it helps at this stage. And if you haven't come across that before, 
um, statements of significance is something that you can um, get advice from the National Historic Ships. And on their website, they've got um, a little booklet on there that you can have a look at and it will talk you through how to write one. Um, also, just, just talking about National Historic Ships, um, at a very early stage, you can also put that past them and, and they might be able to sort of uh, help you slightly. Um, once you're once you're sort of down the line a bit further, they can't help. But at an early stage with your ideas, it's quite a good idea to to involve them if if you can. Um, so that's all the things that you need. Um, but one of the things that I I learned was um, with the outcomes, there are eight outcomes that you need that that they want you to um, want you to hit. You don't actually need to. Uh, try and say that you can do every outcome. So even though there's eight outcomes, it's better to choose say five and do them really well. So at, at first when I was writing it, what I thought was that I had to hit every single outcome. But in the end, what we did is we, we thought we could do five and do them really well. Um, so that's what I would suggest for that. Um, and you've really got to think, um about how you're going to um how you're going to run and operate after the project ends so um once you've once you've done your project and the and the funding stops then what so we don't want a project that uh after after it's funded because it hasn't got any other um ways to, to to support it it collapses so it's really important to think about that as well and how you're going to sustain it um, and, and basically what we're doing with this project to involve more people um, we have run apprenticeships in the past as we have um, with the, the project before but the difference with this um, project and this this fund is we're going to become our own training provider so what that means is um, with that becomes a much more sustainable model for us financially. So it will it will sort of have a much uh, uh, more sort of uh, uh, well, it's a it's a better chance of having a really good legacy. So um, that's that's the point really. Um, and we, we're also thinking about what we're going to do with the boats, how we're going to operate them, and who's going to use them. And you've got to think about the audience and making sure that you are engaging a new audience that you haven't worked with before. So just to show you, we've got we've got this boat called the Ginny. So we're, we're actually not, not looking at really big vessels again. We're looking at quite small vessels. But this is one of the boats that we're going to be doing. And we've got another boat called Jassa. Um, they are a lot more sort of modern <laughs> than we uh, than we we've done in the past. Um, but what we what we're thinking about here is how to engage a different audience. So the Jassa, for example, this boat was um, originally used as a scientific research vessel, um, which looked at the water quality on the coast and what we want to do with that is we want to engage um, not just young people um, but public as well we want to uh, get that boat working again on the estuaries that it used to work in so thinking about the coal where we are um, and to do much more of a um, an in-depth study of the environment so that's that's what we're doing with that so it's a different thing from going out sailing but it's it's, eng it's engaging a new audience in something a bit different. So and it's also we're going to um, put electric engines in both of the boats. So we're trying to make um, our processes a bit more environmentally sustainable. We're also looking at the products that we can build the boats with and and how how we can source things that are um, much more sustainable. Um, so yeah, that's that's that one we've got. A similar thing with Ginny as well. So the stories behind the boats, uh, the the, the history behind them is quite important. So this was um, 
This is Richard, who used to own the boat before he donated to, it to us. Um, this was the first boat that the, the company shared in Mersey um, owned, and this is what built their business. And so it, it's all about the oyster story that the boat tells and how through that family, um, they they managed to sort of maintain all the oysters and um, keep them surviving. <laughs> Or when when lots of places couldn't and and that then comes on to the story about how important the environment is and how important oysters are to that environment and everything else living so the, the oyster is really really key to the to the whole environment story and that's why this boat is important to us and um, and that's kind of where we are so we are currently in our development phase, which um, we have 12 months to do. You can have up to two years, but we think we can do it in 12 months. Um, the deadlines um, for submission are around every three months. Um, and then this decisions are sort of up to another 10 weeks. Uh, and then once we get a decision, we'll then hopefully get a permission to start pretty soon after that, which means we'll be at able to go ahead and, and start the project and um, you're not allowed to start anything without a permission to start so we're not allowed to start building the boats or digging foundations or anything else before um before we're allowed that permission to start um so yeah there, there's some of my top tips and some of the things i've learned this is the first sort of lottery bid that i've ever written um so i am learning as well um <laughs> uh, so i hope that you've found that useful um, and any questions that you want to ask me, um, yeah, feel free to ask. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Felicity. That was really, really very encouraging and uh, motivating. And uh, <coughs> we, I'm sure, well, I've already picked up several questions, which we will come back to. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to go on now, please. Um, assuming that's your last slide, this is that right? If you'd like to uh, <clears throat> close your presentation then, and Delphine will come on. I'm very pleased to have Delphine Jasmine Belil uh, with us this evening because she is development manager for the Heritage Alliance, which is the umbrella body for all heritage organizations in the in England and indeed the the, uh, the other nations as well. Um, and uh, it is, uh, she, she is a great colleague, I'm pleased to say, and what I'm really uh, bowled over by is that she is willing to give us her time and energy as a trustee of the Maritime Heritage Trust, um, which has been a learning experience all round. Thank you very much, Delphine, over to you. Yes, I think uh, Henry's uh, gained a, a much closer knowledge of how much French Canadian can talk in a single meeting. <laughs> Um, so hello everybody. I'm really, really uh, privileged to be to be among you today. Um, so as as Henry say uh, said, I'm I'm not from the maritime heritage background myself, although I do have a bit of of sea air from the the Saint Lawrence, Saint Lawrence River uh, that flows through my vein. Um, but I am uh, more fun, a fundraiser in the heritage sector. So in my role uh, at the Heritage Alliance, I'm in charge of, of making what is a tiny charity that's really hard to fund into a, a resilient organization that can sustain itself on the, in the long term. And, and I, was, uh, I was hearing, you know, obviously, Philistine and Rose and Philistine, you're mentioning all the stage of, of the, the Heritage Fund, lottery, the, the National Lottery Heritage Fund process. And I was like, yep, I know this. I'm, I'm now knowing by heart the, the, the eight outcomes they're currently using and so on. So it was... Uh, so I can definitely empathize by by the challenge and how, and how daunting it is to to look for funding. And what I'm here today to to offer you is hopefully just a few pointers of of place to look for help. So I'm going to share my screen now, and then let's get let's get this show on the road. So what I want to present today is just that there is a lot of help at hand for maritime heritage organization. They don't even have to just be charities. And and I'm, I said, as Henry said, I've been very, very uh, lucky to be admitted amongst the board of the Maritime Heritage Trust. So I'll be wearing the two hats. You'll have to bear with me. I'm going to change my sailing cap every so often uh, during this presentation. Um, one disclaimer before I properly kickstart is there will be something very glaringly missing in this presentation, which is I am not talking about the National Historic Ships 
Um, I'm not talking about national historic ship because we've got Hannah Cunliffe here and it felt that it, it doesn't make sense for me to talk about them when we've got the, the, the leader by excellence of, the, of that organization that can tell, tell us more about, about the work they're doing in this space. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about today is there is actually something that, that exists for the sector called the Heritage Funding Directory. Uh, so this is a, a platform that contains over nearly 500 entries around UK funders, and this is obviously all around heritage. Um, it is actually also an international funder repertory, um, case studies and guidance, and the all entries have been updated uh, in 2021 and 2022. So it is up to date information. The platform, I'm going to be honest, it's not the best. I'm hoping to fundraise to get a better platform. But the resource and the, the, so the pool of knowledge that exists is there for you to use. And I will, as soon as I'm done, I'm done talking, I'll drop all the links in the chats as well so you can follow up. Um, and I think when it comes to the maritime heritage world, things to think about is, of course, you'll think about conservation. That's a, that's a key part of the work you do. But sometimes actually people underplay how important that the work they're doing around skills. We have funders like the Swire Charitable Trust. They focus on traditional skills. And I know for a fact they have funded, um, you know, maritime restoration project because of the skill element coming to it. So you might want to look at funders that have that, that skill element, actually, as, as a different way to approach, you know, which new funders you could look at beyond the heritage fund. The other thing that, and again, I really love that the way our Felicity presented this is around community. You know, I think very often maritime heritage is, is a really great hub for communities and to own in on that will actually open the door to a lot of different funders. Um, similarly with environment, I think there's certainly an environment dimension to the work that, that is done in both in matter of how we conserve, the story we tell. And, and that is something to, again, think about trying to, so, so what I'm trying to showcase here with that platform is sometimes it's worth thinking beyond just what you think, what you're having to do, but actually what the impacts are going to be. And that might make you more approachable to certain funders that you didn't think were within reach. And, and the last thing to think about when we think about the maritime, about maritime heritage is the power of stories. There's a lot of new funders at the moment that are absolutely focused on bringing new diverse stories to bring stories that goes beyond what, what we're used to on the BBC channel. And, and I think, again, Maritime Heritage has got that absolute funnel and, and that, that wealth of stories. So think about it, about can you bring in new tales that people haven't heard about, about maybe communities that have been less showcased in history books? And that is really going to be a very, very big selling point uh, when it comes to looking for funding. So I said, that's a free resource. Go for it. There's actually a helpline as well. So if you are, you know, struggling to find what you're looking for, you can actually make, you can actually even call somebody at, to the, at the Architectural Heritage Fund, which is one of our partner for this, this platform. And they will actually be able to pick up the phone and help you with your questions. I also wanted to highlight a few sector support programs that are bespoke so these three programs actually all three of them are my some of my babies some of the projects that i've led over the last few years um, and i've highlighted under each of them just an example of what those resources could look like so rebuilding heritage is actually still live uh, there's still webinars happening at the moment there's action learning set if you want to improve it gets support from peers around digital comms and so on but there's also a massive fundraising element including for example fundraising on a budget and i think we all know this none of us have got massive fundraising budget if any at all and i think it's just a good really starting point um I really loved how Rose was talking to us about crowdfunding because it just, I felt it was so approachable. I don't know how you felt about it, but it just felt like, actually, you know what, I can do this. And I've never tried crowdfunding, I must admit. Um, but Heritage Digital really, again, is about showing you the dimension of how you can do digital tools, digital skills into supporting your efforts. Um, there's actually, for example, a, a panel recording around how can you charge for digital content? because that's a big question. And you also will have a wealth maybe in your archives of imagery, of documents. Well, actually, is there any copyrights that you can start, you know, can you start using this to generate income? So that's, again, just thinking differently about the income generation. And then finally, I've added a, the Digital Heritage Hub. Again, all these links will be shared in the chat in a second. 
And that includes over a hundred questions uh, around digital. And, and these are really designed as toolkits, as resources for small and medium organization. So they are really practical. And for example, there's one is how does digital fundraising fit into mass business strategy? Now, I would be doing a, a very poor job as trustee if I didn't talk to you for a second about the Maritime Heritage Trust. Now, you'll have seen the name. You might be familiar with it as one of the hosts of this webinar. And I think sometimes when it comes to, to fundraising, there's a massive power in partnership. And also there's a great comfort sometimes in just understanding what others are doing. And this is what the Maritime Heritage Trust offers, is that sense of community and belonging. Um, so I just wanted to invite you all, if you haven't joined already, it's really affordable. We're looking for an organization at only £75 and £30 for an individual. And it will enable you to have access to a set of news, promotion, advice and support, accessing people like Henry, uh, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis, but also that sense of community. So we're launching more coffee, coffee and chats, virtual coffee and chats every month at the end of, I think, last Fridays of every month going forward. So by joining into this, you can really have a chance to actually think about new ideas, sense check where you're at, having a mode. We had um we had a long chat, like the last coffee chat we did around like how frustrating it is when funders don't get back to us and how that makes us feel. And sometimes that just helps us propels us forward. So I just I'm really, really um warmly welcome you all to join. And then the last thing um I wanted to mention is obviously the Heritage Alliance, which is the organization I work for. Um if you sometimes want to know what's going on on the bigger picture, I really recommend joining for free at the newsletter called Heritage Update. So that's our, our sector newsletter. It's every fortnight. You'll have news about the big funding stream coming on. We've got obviously the 2nd of March is when the Heritage Fund is going to launch their new strategy. So that's going to be a, a big day to put in our calendar because we'll now know how to angle our future bids so that we're successful with the Heritage Fund. Um, and it just keeps you posted. There's also jobs, there's events. So do sign up. It's free. It's there for you and would love to to hear more and obviously um, join in the conversation. So that is that is my very, very whistle stop tour about some resources and network available from our time heritage organization. Delphine, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't realize you were going to give all these plugs for for, for everybody here, but uh, that's wonderful. And uh, if we can go now, please, there'll be plenty of discussion of those things. And thank you very much also for putting the, the links in the chat. Um, one or two people have said they may not be able to copy very easily the chat column, but we'll try and think of a way of making that information available um, after the event. So um, <clears throat> uh, don't don't give up on that, please. Uh, now, I'd like to turn to, uh, to John, John McGoran. Um, an old colleague who is known to many of you as skipper and business manager of the paddle steamer Kingsway Castle. Uh, John very successfully managed and skippered the paddle steamer on the River Medway for over 25 years. And as you know, it has now uh, found a new life uh, in the southwest of England on the River Dart, uh, back to its home. But like all the things we care about, it consumes resources and has to be rebuilt. And John is now in the early stages of, or perhaps well, halfway through possibly, um, a major rebuilding uh, program, which has to be funded. And I just wondered if John, if you'd like to give us a few headlines just to, for us to think about as we um, start the discussion. And in particular, what your, what your view is so far of employing a fundraiser. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, you can hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Jolly good. Um, well, as Henry said, um, we ran Kingsway Castle on the Medway for uh, nearly 30 years. And uh, during that time, we did um, quite a lot of fundraising, um, including we had an HLF uh, grant for a new boiler around 2000. Um, we had various incomes from um, uh, grant giving trusts, including the Manifold Trust and others. Um, it was also an area when local authorities had more money, so we managed to tap them, uh, Rochester, uh, upon Medway, etc., and uh, private donations, etc. Um, I would think in the generality of fundraising uh, for ships, um, I would very much support what Felicity said uh, earlier, that um, it's really important, maybe rule one, rule two, 
rule three, rule four, and rule five is that um, you have to have a good and sustainable business plan uh, for your product. Um, uh, and it's no good just restoring it and then it falls uh, flat on its uh, face. And I think that's a really important thing for all people who are fundraising really, to have a business plan that actually works. I mean, all of us think we have a lovely project and uh, uh, people should uh, donate to it and give to it simply because uh, we think it's, it's wonderful. But you need to have a plan in place that will make the uh, the operation sustainable, I think, in, in, in the longer term. Um, and funders, um, I mean, key thing, funders don't like chucking money down the drain. You know, they want to see um, things progressing. I think also, for me, another issue, as I'm now so old, is that uh, the whole process of uh, rebuilding and restoring historic ships uh, repeats itself in that um, we're all trying to re raise money for our projects now, but ships really are designed to last 25, 30 years or thereabouts. So whatever we do to them now, really you need to do it again in, in due course. Um, of course, if you look after your ship, it'll last longer and such like, but um, wood rots, uh, steel corrodes and this is a repeated thing. Um, the masters of uh, ship rebuilding, in my view, are the Swiss. Um, there are, as you may know, 17 battle steamers on the different Swiss lakes. And um, they have a policy really where every 25 to 30 years, the ships are rebuilt as a matter of course. Um, when I was there, I first started going in the late 1980s. And for example, the Stadt Luzern, the flagship on Lake Lucerne, had just been completely rebuilt. Um, or a wonderful new feature in Sofra. Well, she was out of service from 2018 to 2021 for another rebuild. And therefore, one, this is a never ending process, really, to keep ships in service. And if you don't do things, ships, as we all know, ultimately they sink. And uh, it seems to me that maybe about 50 years of doing nothing to a ship is uh, the moment when they start to sink. You may know that uh, last April, the USS Sullivan's uh, Second World War American destroyer in Buffalo, um, she, her hull was leaking and they had pumps, but the pumps were not up to the job and she sank. And as you may know also, the Queen Mary, Cunard's Queen Mary, which has been in Long Beach since uh, 1967, um, she, has had to have new pumps installed because her whole sort of leaks so much. But anyway, there we are. Uh, one needs to rebuild ships. Um, for us now with KC, it is probably a harder sell for raising funds than it was on the Medway because then we were running the ship. Now she's on charter to the Dart uh, Railway. Um, she's established, she's running, and people sort of ask, well, why do you need money when it's running? Well, you know, ships wear out and they do need to replace it. In the current rebuild, and we're doing a major rebuild at the moment to set her up really for the next 25 years like the Swiss, um, our major um, contributors to that so far, um, and we've got in excess of half a million pounds, so far has come from basically our supporter group. And you should never forget the importance of that. Uh, particularly the Paddlesena Preservation Society, which has been magnificent in the donations it meant, is given. Um, they also have a magazine, so we send out uh, applications for money through that. We've distributed flyers, etc., through them, and also flyers, fundraising flyers around the Dart Estates of the Dart Railway and the Dart Boats, which has brought in uh, money. Um, we've also revamped our website. Uh, to encourage donations and to make it easy to donate so anyone who comes to the website now um, can donate by direct bank transfer and uh, by credit card or by uh, debit card we set up a, an arrangement with paypal so they can also collect and we try to encourage uh, visitors uh, to the website by putting posts on um, with news updates and interesting stories to try to encourage more people to come in. And when they come to the website, hopefully they might give us some money in the process. <clears throat> and sometimes these stories are a bit wacky to try to encourage a bit of interest. For example, we put one today up about how long do galley flues last on uh, on paddle seamers because obviously they're in a quite hostile environment, all the smoke going up them. And we um, use Twitter to try to encourage people to come 
uh, to the website to see these things. Um, also, there are more old-fashioned things that one tries to use, like um, the, the more traditional media, um, even though that is in some ways in retreat. And um, things were cast in the last year. We managed to get on the Antiques Road Trip and uh, Michael Portillo's Times Radio and uh, local press, etc. Um, and we've also um, uh, tried to increase our fundraising, um, engaged a professional fundraiser for the first time. Um, so the, we'll see how that uh, progresses in due course, applying to different charitable trusts. Um, and there's a lot of charitable trusts out there. And in fact, that's something that maybe the sector might look in due course at trying to assist people in producing lists of those charitable trusts which might be uh, more helpful towards the, the maritime uh, sector. So we'll see how that pans out. Um, but at the moment, Casey's uh, the first uh, major phase of a rebuild will, will be completed this summer, and we have the funding in place for that. Uh, and we have more work to complete that uh, uh, next winter and then the winter after that. But I'm pretty optimistic at the moment, Casey has a pretty uh, good uh, future. And maybe in conclusion, just saying that, uh, just re emphasizing the point that. The most important thing for all of us is to have a business plan in place that works because people uh, will not donate ultimately to something that doesn't work. Um, and uh, people are often quite canny at seeing what uh, what does work and what doesn't. So I think that's my contribution at the moment, Henry. Thank you very much indeed, John. That's uh, <clears throat> really sound advice as one, as one would expect, um, particularly on the importance of the business plan. Well, now we're, 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 there have already been several questions and I have picked them up, but before we do that, I would like to go to Hannah, Hannah Cunliffe, who is known to all of you and who has very kindly agreed to provide us with a kind of some thoughts, some further thoughts on some of the things that have come up. Hannah, over to you. Thanks very much, Henry, and good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many participants on this webinar. Um, I just really wanted to say a few words about National Historic Ships as the um, body tasked with representing historic vessels and maritime heritage projects across the UK um, and the ways that we can help those who are seeking funding. Um, I mean, as, there's been some fantastic examples tonight, um, particularly Felicity and Rose have both talked about approaching National Historic Ships during their projects and some of the ways that we were able to help them on their journeys. Um, just to take that a little bit further, so obviously with crowdfunding campaigns, um, if, you, if you've got that in mind, if you come to us, um, we can talk you through the approach, we can give you examples of other successfully run crowdfunding campaigns across the historic vessel sector. We can also talk about things that work and things that don't work, and we can give some examples of the type of rewards that you might like to, to think about offering as part of your campaign. Um, but probably the biggest thing we can do for anyone running a, a crowdfunding campaign is promote it. So um, we have our monthly newsletter. We can obviously put it on there. We can put it on our website. Um, we cover all the social media channels and we can plug it and we can retweet um, throughout the campaign. So I strongly advise anybody considering a crowdfunding campaign for their vessel to get in touch and we'll do our best to help. Um, turning to uh, funding applications like Felicity's for the National Lottery Heritage Fund, again, we're really happy um, if you want to approach us and we'll do our best to advise. Um, Felicity came to us at quite an early stage in the project, so we were able to talk through her ideas and give us some feedback. Um, it's worth saying that we are expert advisors to the lottery, so um, they will in, in many cases come to us if they get a historic vessel application and ask us to give advice on um, the viability of the project, the significance of the vessel um, and how sustainable it may be in the longer term, for example. Now, because we know we're going to be asked for advice, um, there is a, a limit to how involved we can be with applications. We certainly can't write them for you, um, but we will always encourage you to come to us so that you can tell us your ideas and we can help with those. We can make suggestions. We can put you in touch with other similar projects to get ideas or maybe to form a partnership. Um, and we can also recommend things like writing a statement of significance, which is another thing that Felicity referred to. 
So I have put in the chat the guidelines to our template on writing a statement of significance. Um, it's a really good USP for any um, application. Uh, it just sums up very succinctly a vessel's heritage merit um, and why she's significant. So um, we do recommend that people try to draft one. If you get in touch with your draft, again, we can go through it with you. We can give you feedback on it and we can make comments. And then when it's in its finished form, we'll publish that statement of significance on the vessel's uh, record entry as well. So it's then in the public domain. Um, so if you're if you're thinking about doing a funding project, we have got written funding guidelines on our website. These are both from the point of view of those looking for funding and from the funders point of view. So it's how we can help you on your funding journey and the advice that we give to the funders. So I'll put a link in the chat in a minute to those funding guidelines so that you can download them and have a look after after the webinar tonight. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just flag was our small grant scheme. So we do offer grants to historic vessel owners ourselves. And as it happens, we've just launched the latest round of our grant scheme today. So it is now live. Um, you're able to apply for a grant if your vessel has been on the National Register of Historic Vessels for over 12 months. Um, it's a very simple online application form, but don't get too excited. I'm afraid um, we do have quite limited resources and the grants that we can offer are only up to a thousand pounds or 50% of the project, whichever is the lesser. Um, I can hear you groaning. It's not a huge sum of money. It's not going to solve you know, all the problems of our sector. But what we do um, say is it's, it's aimed principally at remedial works, um, urgent maintenance, unplanned maintenance that may crop up. Um, it's useful for stabilization. We funded things like covers for a historic vessel to keep it um, safe and protected throughout the winter, for example. Um, and we can also help with things like conservation planning. So do take a look at, at that as a possible resource, um, particularly if you're a private owner or a small charity or trust. Um, you know, it's, it's the type of money that can, can really help out. Um, what we say generally with it is it, it's not because it's such a small sum of money, um, it won't be um, that helpful for a bigger conservation project. But as I say, it can be very useful um, in a short term unplanned maintenance situation. And I will also put the link to that in the chat in a minute. Um, yeah, so I think that's the main sort of summary of, of what we can offer as an organisation. Probably the main thing to say is if, if you would like some advice or guidance, just get in touch and we will do our best um, to help. Thank you very much indeed, Hannah. That's, uh, that's very, really helpful and uh, all positive suggestions. If the other members of the panel would like to rejoin, please, and we'll, we'll, we'll open up for our discussion. Um, and first question for Rose, which is um, one of our uh, attendees said that you mentioned in your talk having a designer and she is interested to know, was this a paid role? Uh, yeah, so we had um, we had Gina Nadal, who's a really good designer based in Manchester, um, and it, it was a paid role. Um, we were lucky enough to have um, some money in our arts council budget uh, from the the money we received from them um to pay people for these for the crowdfunder um and so that's that's how we paid her um but that question does raise an interesting point about uh, the costs of crowdfunding um so we had quite low costs um overall but that so they would be the the cost of rewards um, and um, making the videos and things like that. Um, and we did have to obviously make sure that we um, kind of took those costs into account when deciding how much money we wanted to ask for. Um, so that is quite an important part of it. Um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much. I've just seen another question come in where people are asking about YouTube, but I'll come on to that in, in just a moment. Before we do that, thanks, Rose, for that. Uh, Felicity, there were two or three questions on, on your talk. Um, one is, uh, how do you deal with, with, with sale training? How do you deal with the MCA? Is there an MCA issue and is it difficult to, to deal with or, is, or have you got a route that uh, you, you use for that? Um, I realise well, it's a very big topic. So, <laughs> um, 
Pioneer is a uh, category two. Um, so that means it can go 60 miles from a safe haven. Um, and uh, Priscilla, um, we actually, um, when we rebuilt her, or uh, we, we thought about that as well and what coding we needed. Um, so in theory, she could she could be category two as well. Um, but we've got a local license at the moment, but it is something that you really do need to think about. Um, so the sorts of things that you'll need for coding um, that smacks don't really have, and I don't know about other, other vessels, but uh, the guardrails, um, also sort of the scupper heights and things like that. So um, that's all about the, the way the water drains and how quickly that needs to drain um freeboard <laughs> all of those sorts of things but you can get them at a really early stage you can you can find out what you need um and the, the, the best thing to do is get a surveyor on board really sort of soon so in all that the all the planning stage um even now um we've got a surveyor um who is uh writing all of our plans for us so as well as doing all the time table and costings, he's also making sure that it's in line with what we need for the MCA, which will mean there there will be some adjustments. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> hope I've answered the question. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I mean, you know, we we could we could have a topic all night quite easily on on this one. Uh, I know that, but uh, thanks very much. I mean, that gives a good a good general steer. One other one, which is quite interesting. And I'm sure this comes up because of the pressures on sustainability. One of our other listeners asked, have you discovered or did you consider any reliable sources of electric engines or, or is, are they not really available yet? What's what's your take on that? Um, we've actually we had a, another project that we did um, a few years ago, which was um, uh, it was called John Constable, and it was actually a 45 foot um, lighter that we um, restored, and we put uh, electric engines in them. Uh, so, and they've they've been operating for quite a few years now, very successfully. So, um, I can find out. <laughs> I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but I can find out what we put in there. But we are going to be looking at the latest technology and the most sort of efficient um, way of you know propulsion whether that that might be a hybrid system or it might be solely electric depending on on how it can be recharged and um, one of the ideas was to have a, a, fl a floating pontoon with solar panels um, which means it can be completely self-sufficient um, because where we are it's, it's not that difficult it's not that easy to actually find a, a fuel source so yeah we're looking at that at the moment but I don't have um uh, concrete at all sort of plans but we've, we've got an idea um they could probably if they want to contact me directly I could pass it on <laughs> okay no thank you very much I mean again it's a big topic and uh, <laughs> you know we, it's probably something that needs another evening but thank you very much for that and then th the, la the last of the three I picked up for you was um in your application to the lottery, and I realise this may not be, this may still be work in progress. Can you give any idea of what the balance is between the money you had to raise for the for the actual vessel restoration, as opposed to what you got from the lottery? You know, was it something like two thirds to one third, or um, you um, know? yeah? Well, I can I can tell you that. Um, so we've, I think it's 95% that we've got funded. So we've only had to put 5% in from ourselves. And that 5% has come from volunteer time which, and trustee time. So actually, you know, it's, it's more of an in-kind cost than, um, than an, actual, an actual cost. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, the lottery is quite good in that way um, that you can, quite a lot of the funds you can um are raised um by them and you know we we didn't actually have to put in a, a lot um but you can put more in if you want to i think uh, yeah <laughs> okay no that's great thank you very much um and and you know as somebody else has said it, the in-kind um 
uh, contribution, you know, is, can be a real lifesaver for, for projects. Um, could we turn to the question, the recent question about YouTube? Um, one of our listeners said, this is actually potentially quite a good source of funding. Does any, anyone on the panel want to offer a view on that? And I, I guess that one, one, one project that people might be aware of is the uh, phenomenally successful um, couple on Merseyside who are restoring the, um, is it called Ship Happens? Yeah, I thought I remember that. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they've got this fantastic uh, set of YouTube videos, which um, have, I think, you know, tens of thousands of followers. Um, I don't know how much they've raised, but, more, but perhaps even more generally, does anyone want to comment on YouTube as a potential funding source? Delphine, would you like to say? I think um, I'm not an expert on YouTube, um, but... I think what it does open up is the importance around audience engagement. So, of course, YouTube, when you reach a certain level of subscriber, you will get, you can start getting advertising income. Um, I think that we're, we're talking about something that is quite, um, you know, the volume there needs to be quite significant. But I think what that does open up is actually trying to get a platform where you get more people to know about you. And that can ties into crowdfunding like Rose did. And can also talk ties in into Patreon channels where actually people can pay a subscription to have access to content on a monthly basis, for example. And we do know actually, for example, Tiller and Wheel, um, which yeah. are based in the yeah. where are they? Where are the, thank way. you. That's the one. Um, they they use Patreon as a way to generate income. Um, we also know other, for example, other industries such as the uh, vintage fairground industry, which obviously does a lot of uh, detailed painting. They actually started to use Patreon channel to do courses in paintings and so on. So, what? So there is a potential. I would say it comes with a hell of a lot of work. Um, what I am going to put in the chat, though, is we do have resources about how you can create easy video content just using your phone. I think that is quite reassuring sometimes that you don't have to have a professional videographer when it comes to creating content. So I'll plunk that in the chat as well as hopefully a useful resource. Yeah. And I could see you nod. I wonder if you, you had something to add there. No, no, I was just completely agreeing with your um, suggestions there, Delphine. I mean, there's been quite a few historic vessel projects recently that have done really well on YouTube. Um, there's a really famous Tally Ho project, which some of you may know, a restoration project over in the US, um, and it's generated a huge amount of followers um, just following that restoration over a number of years. So I think exactly as you said, it's just a really great way as well to kind of adv advertise the projects and, and reach out to those new audiences. And then obviously that can generate generate the the crowdfunding opportunities as well that that Rose has pursued um I've just put or I will just put now the a couple of those projects you mentioned in the chat as well just because it is worth having a look at those YouTube channels or the Patreon um as a as an option for funding a scheme I think is fantastic and and going really well so I'll pop those into the chat so people can have a look at them afterwards am I right in thinking that Ash Fair Ring uses YouTube or does he have a separate one yeah, so um, Ash Faring is um, another young preservationist, if I can call him that. He's um, restoring a barge yacht growler up on the East Coast, and he's done really well as well with um, sort of video campaigns about the project. Um, I think he does use YouTube, but also Instagram. Um, and that's obviously a great way as well of just putting those video clips out there and starting to generate an audience. Yeah, and we had a, we had a good talk from him last year. I think it was last year or... Um, anyway, it's somehow you will find it on our um, uh, platform. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can't find it, just email us um, support at maritimeheritage.org.uk and, and we'll answer it. The other thing that occurs to me is that we'll try and collect together the, uh, the various links that have been put in the chat. Uh, and if, if, if all those who've put them on um, are happy, we'll, we'll put it on our website. Is that, uh, is that acceptable? Um, you know, in other words, there's nothing wrong with those links being available more generally. Yeah. Anyway, let me know by tomorrow if you don't agree. <laughs> um, we will obviously try and put the recording of this on the um, uh, on, on the YouTube um, channel that we have, uh, and then you will be able to watch it. So we're really coming up to our, our, our end time. And I just wonder if there are any other um, 
um, <clears throat> any other questions uh, or comments that people would would like to make. I'm just going to have a quick look um, at the at the Q and A to see if we've got anything more. I think uh, picked up most of those. Um, John Evans, who's one of our uh, trustees, has uh, or co-opted board members, has has said, uh, "Are we are we spending enough time thinking about uh, the small historic vessels, the, the the Norfolk dinghies, the St. Moore's one designs, the Sharpies, um, and uh, you know, do they get enough attention because they are very historic in their own way, um, and uh, sometimes you know, the trouble with." Very athletic sailing is that people think, well, once it's done its job, you know, it can it can it can just be disposed of, and and history isn't captured in the same way. Um, I think that's uh, you know a point that that has been well made. Um, <clears throat> so I think the um, um, I see someone is mentioning Culture Hive, or was that from you, Delphine? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, We'll put all of these uh, on 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 the web page. Um, <clears throat> any any concluding comments? And I know I would like Hannah just to say a bit about the next webinar. I mean, this is now our third year organising these winter webinars. The, the the common feature is is me learning about the controls. The trouble is that uh, I don't remember what I've learned. <laughs> but there we go. Um, but any concluding comments, please, from members of the panel? Any other thoughts that they would like to? suggest given what you've heard rose any any further thoughts um yeah maybe i'll just say um that when me and hugh decided to to go ahead with the crowdfunder we really had uh very little experience <laughs> um and we we were also kind of beginners in the social media and um so you don't need to like be an expert or or even feel very confident um it's actually it is a really approachable way of um uh, raising funds and there is lots of resources out there and it's kind of very user friendly um we also had a very very small following when we started and we gained about 200 followers in the four weeks um in of the campaign so yeah I definitely recommend crowdfunding is a, a really approachable option. Thank you very much. And I think you brought that out very well, that, you know, you really gave that sense that anybody can have a go at this. And uh, it's all about the effort you put into it. Um, so thank you very much. And there is stuff. I mean, the crowdfunder people do produce videos and so on, and you can access some of those via the Rebuilding Heritage website, um, web page rather on the Heritage Alliance uh, uh, website. So, you know, it's all, it is all there. Uh, and um, let me ask uh, John. John, anything else you'd like to add or views on on what you've heard? Your your mute. Sorry about that. Um, only to put a plug in for YouTube. Um, I have discovered this comparatively recently, and there's absolutely wonderful oasis of stuff out there, all sorts of obscure stuff, and um, people do make money out of it. So um, I would uh, be very much in favour of uh, YouTube. I pretty much stopped watching terrestrial television and now look at paddle steamers on YouTube most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trouble. It's so distracting, isn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> but, but thank you, yes. <laughs> If you can make money out of it, so much the better. <laughs> okay. Um, Delphine, anything else you'd like to add? Um, just two two final thoughts. And and I think talking from somebody who, who does fundraising as, as a part of her day job is you the worst thing I've ever seen happen is when people give up. I think it's very easy to feel really dejected after receiving no for funding, but it's happened to me as well. Um, but the truth is you will learn every time through the process and you will actually own in on what makes you special, on what the impact of the project is, on the communities you want to engage with. And so even if you get a no one, two, three, four times, that doesn't mean your project isn't viable. It doesn't mean your thinking is not going to get funded. Um, just don't give up. 
and think differently perhaps maybe bring different expertise have a chat with hannah and her team have a chat with us at the maritime heritage trust but don't give up and the second part as well is we've talked a lot today about the heritage fund which is obviously the, the biggest funder in the sector there's actually a wealth of funders that are a little bit smaller but sometimes a number of small pots including the small grants from the nhs um that's not only show it shipped. I keep calling you NHS, but I realize that doesn't sound quite right. Um, I think that can actually end up quite a nice amount as well sometime and might be as easy to get as a single grant from a large funder. So those two final thoughts from me. Thank you very much, Delphine. That's great. Um, <clears throat> Felicity, um, any final thoughts from you? Um, yeah, that was quite interesting, actually, what Delphine just said um, before or in between the, the sort of the, the larger pots of money. Um, I'm very familiar with a lot of the smaller grants, and um, I think uh, that, that it's really worthwhile and getting your skills as well. I mean, the, this um, lottery bid is the first big one that I've done, but I've written a lot of smaller bids before this, which has really helped. Um, uh, help sort of get the storytelling in the right way and um, trying to be clear you know when you're actually writing so I think uh, definitely um, having say 10 small um, grants soon adds up to quite a lot of money so that's well worth it and um, yeah and the, the other thing is um, really think about the, the end use of, of, the pro of your project um, and how you're going to benefit the public um, because ultimately it's public money, so how are you going to use it to, to benefit the public? There's there's quite a lot of people that come and ask me about different boats, um, but they they haven't thought about the next step. So what next? The boat's ready to go, then what? And and um, I've seen that with a few projects, and it's a bit disappointing. Um, so yeah, it's it's really I think really helpful to to have all of that before you even start. So that's what I'd say. Thank you very much. Yeah, very sound, very sound advice. Um, Hannah, the final word. <laughs> and if you could please um, tell us about your thoughts for our next session. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Henry. I think there's some great advice there from all the panelists, actually, points that I would definitely agree with. Just one more. Um, tip I guess for me when you're writing a funding application please 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 remember contingency it's so important and at the moment we're finding a lot of projects are really struggling because of inflation because of rising material costs there are projects that are finding that you know what they were quoted when they put their application in has now doubled or trebled and their contingency just wasn't enough so you know really really important not to undersell yourself on on that side of the application and the funders will Will respect that you've researched that and, and put in an appropriate sum so so yeah just a little extra yeah. tip there I'm very yeah. happy to yeah. chat about that if, if anyone wants to get in touch and I put our general info address in the chat so um, you know feel free to to come to us for advice and, and guidance on anything that's been talked about tonight um, in terms of the next webinar, Henry's um, kindly given it a little plug. Um, we're thinking to do another one of these um, later this spring. And the topic that we are going to focus on next time is going to be governance. It's very much related to what we've talked about tonight. Um, as expert advisors to the lottery and other funders, one of the most common points of failure for a, a lottery bid is often that actually the organisation is not perhaps as strong in terms of governance as it needs to be to manage and maintain an investment of that kind. Um, it is about making organisations more resilient. It's about having the right business model. Um, it's also about how to structure a trustee board and how to find new trustees to bring into that, that organisation. Um, we at National Historic Ships have also had a lot of inquiries recently from people who want to address this, who want to look at different governance models, different types of charity, maybe moving a vessel from private ownership into a not-for-profit setting. Um, and it is difficult to know 
know you know which way to proceed so this is going to be the focus of our next webinar we will have a similar format to tonight we'll have some presentations and we'll have a panel um, we'd really like to hear from you if this is a topic you're interested in do get in touch let us know exactly what you'd like to have discussed um, any ca case studies any points of interest and we'll do our best to make sure they're included so yeah we look forward to seeing you all back here very soon um, for, for some more discussion and I just before I close would just like to say a huge thank you to Henry um, for organizing this webinar tonight um, you undersell yourself on technology I think you've done a great job and, and it's been really nice to host it in partnership again thank you very much Hannah that's a gener generous tribute I mean my <clears throat> my comfort zone is usually putting coal into a boiler but uh, uh, you know I've had to learn a few things um, just one final plug please to to do think about joining Maritime Heritage Trust as well because um, one of the one of the things we can offer we we can't offer everything but what we can offer is talking through your issues with friendly and experienced people and you heard about Delphine's coffee mornings uh, and those are getting going at the end of each month Friday last Friday of every month uh, and uh, you know if you have uh, issues that you'd like to see discussed uh, please please do join us and thank you all very much for attending um, taking part uh, and you'll be able to watch the recording and the other follow-up thank you all very much good night and particular thank you to my panelists who really uh, performed excellently in every respect uh, particular thanks to Rose, Felicity, Delphine, John and Hannah thank you all good night Yeah. Well done. Well done.